I'll tell you, I am so blessed, so blessed to be here with you. You know, as uh, Bailey was saying, I grew up in Cuba under a very oppressive military dictatorship. As a result of that, the revolution started in the high schools and the universities. And so I found myself as a teenager involved in a revolution. As a result of that, I was captured, imprisoned, tortured, but by the grace of God, even though I didn't know him, he knew me. So by the grace of God, I was able to leave Cuba and come to the greatest country on the face of the world. I am so proud to be an American. I remember when I was in the revolution in Cuba, there was this young charismatic leader talking about hope and change. His name was Fidel Castro. <laughs> and we all followed him. We didn't know any better. Well, that was in late 1957 when I came to the States. And in 1959, when Castro took over, I went back to Cuba in August of 59. And did I ever get a shock? Because that same man that had been talking about hope and change was now talking about how the rich were evil, about how they oppress the poor, and about the need to redistribute the wealth. He began uh, attacking freedom of the press, shutting down newspapers and radio stations, television stations, then began attacking freedom of religion. To give you an idea, soldiers would come into a kindergarten class and would tell the kids, close your eyes and pray to God for candy. Where's the candy? No candy. All right, close your eyes again and pray to Fidel for candy. And while the kids had their eyes closed very quietly, those kids would place candy on every desk. You know, we need to realize that we are under a lot of religious persecution in America, specifically Christian persecution. We just saw a good dose of that this morning. Don't, don't make any mistake, that decision is about religious freedom in America. And it's going to have tremendous implications curtailing religious freedom in America. But you got to understand that the attack on religious freedom is not the objective. It's only the means. You see, socialism requires that government becomes your God. And in order for government to become your God, they must destroy the concept of God. So anyway, I left Cuba, dissolution, but so happy to be in the land of the free and the home of the brave. This is, without a doubt, the greatest country on the face of the earth. And uh, as I used to tell my son so many times, you know, Ted, when I lost my freedom in Cuba, I had a place to come to. If we lose our freedoms here, where are we going to go? There is no place to go. This is why we must draw a line in the sand. You know, there are a lot of young people here. Thank you. Because let me tell you something. Maybe I'm going to shock you a little bit. It is for you that we are fighting. And let me tell you... Let me tell you something very somber. If we lose this fight, you will not have a future. That's how important this battle is. We're fighting for the future of our children and our children's children. So anyway, I was just so happy to be in America. I uh, went to the University of Texas, started a small business in oil and gas exploration. And then in the late 70s, I was shocked again when I saw a government in this country begin to institute some policies that reminded me of that bearded dictator I left back in Cuba. Some of you may remember the Carter years, over 20% interest rates, double-digit inflation, 
double-digit unemployment, lines around the block to get gasoline, a government so weak in foreign policy that Iran had become so emboldened that they captured 52 Americans and held them hostage for 444 days. You know, it is not coincidental that those hostages were released the day President Reagan was inaugurated. So as a result of what I saw in the Carter years, I became very heavily involved in an organization called the Religious Roundtable. It was a Judeo-Christian organization that mobilized millions of people of faith in America to help elect whom I consider the greatest president in the last 150 years, President Ronald Reagan. My son Ted was nine years old, and all during 1980, our conversation around the dinner table was as to why we had to get rid of this socialist, progressive Jimmy Carter and replace him with a constitutional conservative like Ronald Reagan. So my son Ted, while he was nine years old, he got a dose of conservative politics every day for a year from a Christian worldview. And you know, the Bible says that our steps are ordered of the Lord. I believe this was just a divine appointment. As Ted was entering high school, we introduced him to an organization called the Free Enterprise Institute. So now Ted is 13 years old. He's reading Adam Smith and John Locke and Von Mises and Hayek and Bastiak and Montesquieu and the Federalist Papers and the Anti-Federalist Papers and Milton Friedman. And then this organization creates a group of five kids. My son Ted was one of the five. They called them the constitutional corroborators. They hired a memory expert and taught these five kids to memorize the U.S. Constitution. For the next four years, these five kids would go into a, say, a Rotary Club at lunchtime. They would put five easels in the front of the room and while people were having lunch, they would write the Constitution by memory on those easels and then give a half-hour patriotic speech on free market economics and the Constitution. Before my son left high school, they did approximately 80 speeches, about 20 per year for four years, 80 speeches on free market economics and the Constitution. Before my son left high school, he was passionate about the Constitution. He was passionate about the Declaration, about free markets, about the rule of law, about limited government. And that passion became like fire in his bones. And let me tell you the reason I know my son Ted Cruz will not compromise his principles in Washington is that fire is as alive today as it was 30 years ago. But let me tell you something else that may give you a room, uh, a little bit of thinking. Ted went on to Princeton to study political science. He joined the debate team, and he became U.S. champion and North American champion in debate. He won over 150 first place debate trophies in his four years at Princeton. I'd love to see him debating Hillary Clinton. <laughs> That's going to be a sight to see. Hugh Hewitt was saying at, at supper earlier today that he doesn't think that Hillary would dare get on a debate stage with Ted, but because I think that if, if, if she gets on a debate with Ted, he'll make mincemeat out of her. <laughs> That's going to be a sight to see. Anyway, uh, Ted went on to law school and then went on to clerk for Will, uh, Michael Ludig, the most conservative federal appeals judge in America. And then he clerked for William Rehnquist. As a matter of fact, it's a very interesting story. When Ted was being interviewed by William Rehnquist, Rehnquist saying, listen, Ted, I don't know how you did it, but I have here in my hand a letter of recommendation from the most conservative federal appeals judge in the country. And I got this other letter of recommendation 
from this ultra-liberal professor, Alan Dershowitz. How did you manage that? <laughs> See, Alan Dershowitz has been uh, Ted's professor at, at Harvard, and even, even though they disagreed on everything, they respected each other, and actually they became friends. And Ted has an uncanny ability to pull people from all factions because he's a man that speaks truth. Ted has a new book coming out. It's coming out at the end of this month. And I think that the title, again, is not coincidental. It's called A Time for Truth, Reigniting the Promise of America. Unfortunately, in America today, we have too many politicians that tell you one thing and do something else. How many of you have come across a politician that's running for office that will tell you all these wonderful promises only to get elected and do exactly the opposite? Anybody here? <laughs> but you know something? That is easy to fix. Just remember this. Stop listening to their rhetoric and start looking at their record. Stop listening to what they say. Start looking at what they do or what they have done. Jesus put it this way, ye shall know them by their fruit. It's about time we do some fruit checking. <laughs> you know, we saw it just a few months ago at the Iowa Farm Summit. Every candidate running for president was at the Iowa, and as a matter of fact, most of them had not even declared by then, but they were all there. And every one of them was praising the ethanol subsidies. All because Iowa is the biggest ethanol producer in the country. When it came time for Ted, Ted looked at the chairman of the summit and he said, Well, Mr. Chairman, I'm sure you would also like me to praise the ethanol subsidies. But I'm going to disappoint you. I'm not only against the ethanol subsidies, I'm submitting a bill to get rid of them because they're corporate welfare. <laughs> he got a standing ovation. You know why? Because people are hungry for truth. We have been told so many lies after lies after lies, whether it is Fast and Furious or Benghazi or the IRS or the NSA or Ebola or the missing emails or money from foreign governments. It's lies after lies after lies. Well, I believe as Ted's book says in his title, it is a time for truth. Let me tell you another, another statement that we are hearing a lot. America needs a manager, someone with management experience. No, America does not need a manager. America needs a leader and a fighter. We are in an unprecedented time in America. We're on the edge of a precipice. And let me tell you something, if we have a mushy moderate as our candidate in the Republican Party, we will lose in 200, 2016, and Hillary Clinton will be our next president, and America will be destroyed as we know it. We need a constitutional conservative, someone where they will stand unequivocally for America, for the Constitution, for the rule of law, for limited government. Someone that will be able to unleash the entrepreneurial spirit of America, the innovative spirit of America, what has made America great. You know, it is so sad. There was a survey that was done among college kids just recently. And this survey came up with the conclusion that 65% of college kids expected to live with their parents for as much as two years after graduating because they don't think they can get a job. One of the most damaging things that this so-called social justice, which is nothing more than collectivism and comes right out of Karl Marx, what is done is destroy the dream. We need to reawaken the American dream. This is the land of opportunity. This is a land still that with hard work and perseverance, all your dreams can become a reality.
I know it by personal experience. When I came to this country, I couldn't speak a word of English. I did, practically didn't have any money. And I'll, I'll tell you, I remember when I was sitting in the Senate chambers, watching my son being sworn in as U.S. Senator. I couldn't contain the tears from my eyes. And to now think that he could possibly be the next president of the United States of America, all that comes to my mind is only in America. Only in America. How dare our president say this is not an exceptional country? This is the most exceptional country on the face of the earth. Do you realize this is the only country in the world that was founded on the Word of God? Founded by men and women seeking the freedom to worship Almighty God. What a heritage. And then that heritage was compounded during the first Great Awakening in the 1740s when preachers like Jonathan Edwards and, and Whitfield were the spark that inspired the framers. You know, I go around the country trying to wake up preachers because many of them are hiding behind their pulpits, scared to death of telling the truth. They're more concerned with being politically correct, and I say to them, it's about time they become biblically correct instead of politically correct. But that is not our heritage. Do you realize, if you look at the Declaration of Independence, I count 17 grievances in the Declaration of Independence. Do you realize that each and every one of those grievances were preached from the pulpits of America before they were written in the Declaration? It was preachers from the pulpit calling out King George for the atrocities that the British were perpetrating upon the American people. Where are those pastors today? Many of them are hiding behind their pulpits. Now, perhaps after the decision of the Supreme Court today, they'll start. I think that's a wake-up call to the church in America. And I pray that this decision will serve as a catalyst to wake up the sleeping giant. But I'll tell you, we look at that heritage, and we need to live up to that heritage. It is about time that we lock arms that we stand together shoulder to shoulder to make sure that we have someone leading this country that is a proven leader, that is a proven fighter, that has been at the forefront of every fight, whether it is fighting to protect our First Amendment right to speech, our First Amendment right to freedom of religion, our Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms, our rights of privacy, our rights to live under the rule of law, not under the lawlessness that we are seeing in America today. We are seeing today a president that operates by executive order, by fiat, not much different than that bearded dictator I left in Cuba over 60, almost 50, 60 years ago. But I'll tell you, all of those on constitutional executive orders that this president has written can be rescinded, they won, all of them, by President Ted Cruz. They won. One of the things that Ted has at the top of the agenda is unleashing the American entrepreneurship. Get rid of all these taxes and regulations that are stifling the economy, that are really choking small businesses in America. Myriads of regulations that make it practically impossible for a small business to survive. Just a couple of weeks ago, the Obama administration was indicating that they're going to expand the Clean Air Act, uh, the Clean Water Act, to regulate puddles in your backyard. I mean, it is insane. You can't make this up. But we need, see, government is not the solution like Ronald Reagan said it so clearly. 
Government is the problem. We don't need politicians to go to Washington to expand the federal government. We need less government. We need to cut down the size and scope of the federal government and realize that if it's not in Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution, which is called the enumerated powers of Congress, if it's not there, those, those rights are reserved to the state government. We need less government. We need a leader, a proven leader, that can just inspire America with a vision to make America again that shining city on a hill to the glory of God, that can make us again a leader in the world, not led by a president that goes around the world apologizing for America and where our enemies laugh at us. Putin just laughs at America. Iran is laughing at America. And I'll tell you, if something doesn't happen, Iran is on its way to acquiring a nuclear bomb. And already Saudi Arabia is saying, well, I need a nuclear bomb too. So with this deal, they're actually creating an arms race, a nuclear arms race in the Middle East. We need a leader that would say, not like the administration is saying, well, all we can do is control ISIS. Baloney, if we put all our might, we can destroy ISIS. ISIS is the face of evil, and it needs to be destroyed, not controlled. But that takes leadership. That doesn't take management. That takes leadership, vision, courage. And if courageous conservatives across America will unite, will come together shoulder to shoulder to reignite the promise of America, I guarantee you Americans, America's best days are still ahead. I ask you, I beg you to pray for my son. My son is running against the political corruption in Washington in both parties. In both parties. The establishment in both parties is rotten to the core. But because of that, because he's running against the political establishment in both parties, they're coming after him with everything they got. So how do we win this? We win it with we, the people. You know, the same political pundits in 1980 said Reagan was unelectable, that Reagan was a far-right zealot, and he was unelectable. The whole Republican establishment was against Ronald Reagan. Well, Ronald Reagan didn't just win. I remember the day after the election, that map was just solid red, a couple of little specks of blue. We did it in 1980. We can do it again. And we have a great advantage over 1980. In 1980, there was no internet. There was no email. There was no Facebook, no Twitter, no bloggers, no conservative radio. We have a lot of tools today that we can go around the liberal media and get our message directly to we the people. You see, I saw Ted do it in the Senate race. We had a Senate race where Ted ran against the most powerful man in Texas, a man that had $250 million in the bank, that spent $35 million in attack ads, $22 million from his own pocket. But we the people had other ideas. And that grassroots army started with dozens, then hundreds, and thousands, and tens of thousands. Let me tell you the good news. There are more of us than there are of them. The problem is many of the us have been asleep at the wheel. We had over 4 million conservatives that stayed at home in 2008 and 2012. 
If we have a leader with a vision that can inspire those people, our base, our conservative, our faith base, the people that are true patriots and who love America, if we inspire them to come back to the pool, Paul, we're not only going to win, we are going to win with a sweep. With a sweep. There is a tsunami occurring in America. Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Ted is getting crowds of over 600 people. New Hampshire. Huge crowds in New Hampshire. Same thing is happening in Iowa. Same thing is happening in South Carolina. Same thing is happening in North Carolina. People are waking up and saying, enough is enough. We cannot continue to have business as usual. We need a constitutional conservative who is a proven leader and who is a fighter. And that man is Ted Cruz. Join us. Join us and shoulder to shoulder, let's retake America. Let's make America again that shining city on a hill to the glory of God. Thank you. God bless you. God bless America. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you.